so uh, I'm going to be speaking in English. And I'll try and make this as accessible as possible, but I am aware that what I'm going to be saying is quite technical. Um, and I hope you find it interesting. And if you do find it interesting, then perhaps the thing to do is to uh, either visit the school or visit our website or just track me down and have a conversation with me. Because I think what I'm going to be saying probably takes a, a bit of time to digest. And it might be that uh, some of what I talk about you, you come to think about over the, the coming days and, and weeks. And then, as I say, the questions might arise. Um, so that's who I am. Um, if you do want to uh, have a look at the, the slide deck, there is a, a link there. And you're very welcome. I think I've shared it um, publicly. And you're very welcome to have a look at it. So I'm going to start off um, really just sort of advertising why it is that I'm in education. Um, I love this quote, Neil Postman, I don't know if people are familiar with Neil Postman, he's an American, or was an American, uh, educational commentator who wrote a number of books, uh, uh, all worth reading. And this one is from his book, The End of Education. And I love this as a sort of a statement of intent. Uh, I have not for a single moment abandoned the idea that many of our most vexing and painful social problems could be ameliorated if we knew how to school our young. And I think what's implicit in that is at the moment we don't really know how to school our young. And that certainly is my position, that mainstream schooling has completely lost track of how to school the young. In fact, I would argue that mainstream schooling, as it's developed over the last 120 or so years, has never really understood how to school the young. It got away with it for a long time because there wasn't any very great ambition to school beyond the most basic levels. But now that we live in a culture that requires more and more of all young people if they're going to have any kind of productive role, the demands on school are becoming increasingly high. And what we discover is just how poor school is at meeting those demands. And it's becoming so blindingly obvious now that school isn't doing the job that these kind of meetings that we're having today are becoming, I think, more prevalent the world over. This is taken from a book that was published, as you can see, getting on for 20 years ago now. And it's published by the OECD. The OECD is not a liberal left-wing body in the least. It's a very conservative, practical body. And the question they asked 16 years ago is, can a system designed to sort and reward the most able be reformed in such a way as to help everyone fulfill their very diverse potential? Or if re reform is impossible, is a kind of educational revolution on the agenda for learning? That was 16 years ago. There has been no revolution. And what I'm going to be talking about now is, is what I, I like to think of as the beginning of a revolution, the seeds of a revolution, at least at the school that I'm head of. I, I have a huge uh, privilege insofar as I'm in, a, in an international school. And the, the EDB are interested up to a point in what we do. But I'm certainly not under the same pressures as any of the heads of school in the local system. So I have a, a, an opportunity and I would say a responsibility to innovate because I'm able to. And again, I'm going to go back to Neil Postman. This quote is the one that fuels my thinking very often. The faith is that despite some of the more debilitating, damaging teachings of culture itself, something can be done in schools that will alter the lenses through which one sees the world. Alter the lenses through which one sees the world which is to say that non-trivial schooling can provide a point of view from which what is can be seen clearly. That, to me, is the function of education in a healthy society, is that it is encouraging the young to see what is clearly, honestly, and with courage. So how do you go about creating non-trivial schooling? Because I think most of what students learn at school is trivial. And I include in that many of the things which get the most, uh, the most attention and the most status. Uh, Hong Kong has this kind of love affair with mathematics. Um, 
And, and this will not be popular, but my argument is that most maths is trivial. Why is it trivial? Because you never use it. There's no point in spending all this time getting to grips with something so arcane, so obscure, that finally it's not relevant to the way in which you are going to live your life. And I don't just mean the, sort of the quotidian living of your life on a daily basis. I mean the philosophy at the core of who you imagine you are. But far too much time is spent digging into these so-called rigorous areas of human enterprise, which then end up being completely irrelevant for the people who have devoted that time to them. And that's a great problem, I think. One of the things that that ends up with is people who leave school highly qualified, but very poor human beings. So hence human technologies, and what I'm going to do in the next 15 minutes is just try and sketch to you what human technologies tries to achieve at ICHK, the school at which I'm, I'm head of school. And there are three steps that we have to take to understand what human technologies means. And, and human technologies for us, is a, it, it's a subject insofar as you'll see it on the timetable. All our year 7s, 8s, 9s and 10s and next year 11s also will study within a session designated human technologies. But actually, human technologies is not content, it's not stuff, it is those lenses that Postman was talking about a moment ago. It's a way of orientating yourself to the world, and I'm going to try and explain what that is now. So the first step is that we have to reclaim the word technology. Because when I use that word, I imagine that most of you start thinking of gadgets and devices and electronic gizmos. And sure enough, you know, this is a technology. This is a technology. But there's far more to technology than that. And if you go back to the origins of the word, and it comes from the Greek techne, and techne means art or craft. Ology means knowledge of. So technology means Knowledge of the art or craft of whatever domain it is that you're working within. So let me give you an example of that. Let's talk about medical technology. What is the art and craft of medicine? If we imagine that the art and craft of medicine is nothing other than scalpels and stethoscopes and bedpans, we're missing the point. The art and craft of medicine is being someone who can listen to someone in pain. It's someone who has the commitment to stay up to date with current medical knowledge. It's someone who's able to organize a team of people in a surgical theater. It's someone who has a bedside manner who makes someone feel good about themselves. That's the art and craft of medicine. And you can do that in every single domain that you'd care to think about. If you think about sport, the art and craft of sport is not the boots and the nets and the bats. The art and craft of sport is the tactics. It's the psychology. It's the knowledge of the rules. It's the relationships within the team. So why is it that we've allowed this idea of technology to diminish to the point where it's just about stuff? And I think in answering that question and in, in soul-searching about that question, you really come to the heart of some of the problems we have now in the 21st century, which is that we have this kind of, or this really unhealthy fetish with machines and AI. And in fact, anything which is complicated but not human. And one of the points about humans is we're not complicated, we're complex. And what happens with complexity is that stuff emerges. And it's unguessable and it's unpredictable. You don't know what's going to happen next. That's humans. And really that's what school should be about. How do you cope? How do you thrive in a world full of other people like you who are unpredictable, who have all kinds of aspects to their personality which can't, cannot be placed in an algorithm, that can't be captured in data points that are not a spreadsheet. So the second point, 
once we've established that technology is the art and craft, is to say, okay, let's define it. And this is our definition. A, it doesn't come from us. It comes from Andy Lane, Environmental Systems, Open University, 2011. Technology has three parts. It's about taking action to meet a human need. It's more than just scientific knowledge. It's about values. Because in willing a change, you have to take responsibility for that change being better, right? That's the whole point. That's why you're taking the action. Because you imagine that something's not good enough and you want to improve it. And that is therefore an ethical decision. It has a moral dimension to it. And lastly, it, it must be social. It's shared. That's the difference between an, an invention and a technology. An invention I can create myself. When other people start using it, and drawing on it, it becomes a technology. Okay, the third realization is that once we've be begun to understand that, that technology is the art and craft that we use in order to direct ourselves towards action because we have values and we share that, then all these things become technologies. A temple is a technology. A prescription is a technology, a, a flowchart is a technology, a recipe put is a technology. Greeting someone is a technology. It puts them at ease. The fact that I walk up to someone and shake hands demonstrates to someone that I have friendly intent. If I refuse to shake hands, that says something. Someone quite recently refused to shake hands with Donald Trump. Good technology. A checklist is a technology. And all these technologies we teach at our school. And we teach our students that, that these technologies are things that you can use or you can leave alone. But every time you use them or leave them alone, you are making an ethical decision about the kind of person you want to be. Scripts, systems, devices, etc., etc., all these things are technologies. And they've all been devised by human beings. And they can all be changed. To change them, you have to understand their history. To change them, you have to have the courage to feel that they are worth changing. And that's what school's about. And if, if you don't quite grasp what I'm saying, I'll give you an example. So breathing, is breathing a technology? Clearly not. If you, if you stop breathing for a few minutes, you're dead. However, can you technologize breathing? Yes. If you join a theatre group, one of the first things they'll teach you is how to project your voice, and you do that by breathing from your diaphragm. If you're a sports person, they'll teach you how to breathe in such a way that you can focus at the moments of stress. If you do mindfulness in school, you'll be taught how to breathe so that you can meditate. So your breathing, which is probably one of the most natural things to the human body, can be and is technologized. Wouldn't it be good if every school was concentrating on how it is that you can make the most of yourself through the use of the technologies that you deploy in your everyday life. So here's the technology that we've devised. It's a Venn diagram. It's a five-part Venn diagram. And as you can see, there are four parts nested within the fifth. So the encompassing one is somatic, your body. Because all of us are embodied. Everything else we do is through the vehicle of our body. Our brains are embodied. To talk about the brain as if it were not part of a body is part of the problem that we have. Within that are four further categories. Cognitive technologies are about thinking. Language, I'm using one of them now. This is why we try to convince our students that it's worth them expressing themselves through language in as many languages as possible, as well as possible. Because language is a technology to allow you to get what's up here out there. And if you can do it well, the chances are that you can find yourself in a world in which you have a level of control, a level of persuasion, and it's going to be a world that's going to suit you better as a human being. Um, material technologies are things, stuff, social technologies, are the technologies that we use in order to lubricate the social world, to make sure that we can get on with each other, 
And spiritual technologies, one of the things that are most neglected in schools are the technologies that allow us to know ourselves better. So I've mentioned mindfulness, which is currently quite um, popular in schools, but most schools don't know why they do it, really. They talk about, oh, we're trying to de-stress the kids. What a poor reason to do mindfulness. Why have you got them in a stressful environment anyway? Why do you not have other technologies that work in your school that stop the school being a stressful environment? So I won't go through these in detail because I don't have the time, but what, as I say, you're, you're welcome to, to download the presentation. But what I have done is just given a quick overview of each of the five. So somatic, technologies that live through the body. Cognitive, make our thinking clearer. They would include language, maths, the scientific method, formal logic, thinking tools. So these are things that people teach in school already, but what Human Technologies does is it suggests that they should be taught differently, with a different axis, with a different emphasis. Once you've got enough maths in order to live the life you imagine yourself living, that's enough maths. If you're going to be an engineer, you need more. If you're going to be an actuary, you need more. But if you're not, get enough maths and start doing the things that really are going to help you be the person you want to be. Material technologies, the stuff that surrounds us. People ask me why I dress like this. I always dress like this. I can't understand why anyone wouldn't dress like this in Hong Kong. It's too hot, it's too humid. So I dress like this. Social technologies are the technologies that allow us to get on with each other. They can be taught. Those of you in the audience who are sitting there nodding every so on, you'll, you'll find I start teaching to you <laughs> because I know that you're listening. Even if you're absolutely bored out of your mind, if you just nod at me, it encourages me to keep talking. Whenever I attended university as an undergraduate and a postgraduate, I always sat down the front and I always nodded. <laughs> and I ended up having every lecture lecture just to me. And when I came to seminars, they knew who I was. Now, I didn't think all the lectures were great, and I didn't think all the lecturers were great, but I wanted to be part of that learning contract. So I learned that technology. And as I say, the one that's maybe the most diminished in many schools, the spiritual, which is the heart of why we are on planet Earth. So, in sum... Part of my thesis is that we suffer from hubris. We massively overestimate ourselves as a species. Homo sapiens, where's the evidence? We've trashed the planet that we have inherited. My generation has destroyed it for the generation of my daughter. I owe all the young children in the audience an apology. I'm an oil addict. I can't live without oil in its many forms. But we're going to have to get over that because there isn't enough oil to go round. So we're not homo sapiens, or very rarely are we homo sapiens, but we're definitely homo technologicus. None of us can exist without the technologies that we constantly deploy in our everyday lives. So we need to understand what they are, we need to be responsible for them, and we need to be able to govern them far better than we do at the moment. And this is the tagline. So what makes us potentially smart is the availability of technologies. Intelligence doesn't reside between your ears. Intelligence is what you do with the capacity that your brain gives you. What do you choose from the culture around you? And that's what makes us wise. If we make the right decisions, if we're clued into this notion of a technology as something which is shared amongst the people of our community and we make the right decisions, we will make wise decisions. Thank you very much. <laughs>